Thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I find this uh, this conference a very good initiative, I have to say. Um, uh, let me share the screen. Yes. Uh, and I think that it's uh, uh, it's a really good opportunity to uh, meet uh, and start collaborating uh, and find out what other people are doing in uh, in the neighborhood of uh, of our institute. Uh, so, uh, as it was mentioned, I'm currently in. I mean, I'm still in, in Ljubljana, but uh, where I was for the last uh, three years. Uh, but I have recently moved to Berlin. Um, uh, I guess you see the full screen, right? You don't see any part of it coming. Okay. So I'm uh, I'm referring here to both my present uh, 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 position uh, at FUB, but also the grants that uh, and the uh, University of Ljubljana, where I did most of this work, and the grants that uh, funded uh, my research in the last years. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Hamiltonian demarcation methods, which is uh, uh, a, a, an old method, but uh, uh, we recently revisited it with uh, collaborators and applied it to the dynamics of continuous uh, quantum field theory models. And I think that it's uh, experiencing revisited, uh, renewed interest because there are many uh, applications of it uh, recently. Uh, people from the high energy community are starting to look at it uh, as an alternative to lattice QCD. And uh, from our point of view, uh, it's one of the few methods that uh, is available for the study of uh, uh, cold atom experiments that simulate uh, quantum field theories. So let me pass to the, to the outline of my talk. I will first introduce the motivation uh, that we have in, in this study. Why do we study the dynamics of quantum continuous quantum field theories? Uh, since most of my talk will be, or all of my talk will be, uh, we refer to the, the case of one dimensional, uh, one plus one dimensional models. I'm going to explain why we are particularly interested in this. Uh, and then in the main part of my talk, I will, in the first part, I will talk about uh, some experiments uh, that uh, have recently managed to uh, simulate quantum field theory, so they can play the role of uh, analog quantum field simulators uh, and can help us uh, uh, explore the uh, uh, interesting properties of uh, quantum field theory dynamics and the exotic, I would say, uh, behavior that uh, they have in some cases. And uh, I'm going to uh, explain how do we uh, simulate uh, by means of classical algorithms uh, this uh, type of experiment. So essentially what we are doing is a classical simulation, simulation of a quantum simulator. And I'm going to present the challenges and the, the method that we are uh, using, which is based on uh, RG theory uh, in a numerical implementation. Uh, and in the second part, I'm going to uh, present some of, of the most uh, uh, exciting uh, applications of, of this method that we have uh, made so far. Um, uh, the first of which is the study of uh, correlations uh, in and out of equilibrium in the sine Gordon model, which is uh, one of the models, uh, uh, the main model that can be simulated in this type of experiments. Uh, I will talk about uh, uh, the study of uh, quantum equilibration and recurrences in the experimental system and presenting also the theory behind it and uh, some surprises we found in, in understanding uh, experiments and matching with theory. And in the last part, I'm going to talk about uh, a recent work where uh, we study quantum chaos signatures in uh, in the double sign Gordon model, which is a, a non-integrable uh, model. Okay, so first of all, the motivation. Uh, why do we study quantum fields? Well, we know that quantum field theory uh, describes uh, uh, the uh, describes nature from the short scale to the large scale, 
Um, uh, so it has applications to many areas of uh, physics from uh, quantum cosmology to uh, elementary particles and high energy uh, and also to black hole physics. But it also has applications, as we know, to uh, condensed matter as an effective uh, theory uh, that describes the macroscopic behavior of, uh, of uh, lattice systems and statistical systems. So uh, from the theoretical point of view, the motivation uh, of studying quantum field uh, and quantum statistical mechanics uh, out of equilibrium is that it's related to the problem of quantum equilibration, which is a fundamental and long-standing question in statistical mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, given the microscopic uh, laws of nature, which are described by quantum mechanics, how do we end up in the case of many body systems with uh, the emergence of uh, statistical ensembles, thermal ensembles, etc. At the same time, there are some more practical, uh, uh, some more practical motivation. Uh, we want to understand what are the ultimate limits of our classical thermodynamic expectations and whether we can go beyond that uh, and apply this uh, to quantum devices, quantum thermal engines that have been uh, proposed in the last um, uh, 30 years or something. And uh, of course, we aim to see uh, uh, novel quantum effects at the at macroscopic level, if uh, uh, possible. Now, one may ask, of course, apart from this uh, uh, motivation from the point of view of quantum technologies and applications, why are we interested now? Why is this uh, problem more feasible to study now than in the past, better than more than in the past? And the answer to that is that, uh, on the other hand, there are experimental uh, techniques that allow the study of quantum anybody dynamics uh, in ultra cold atoms. I'm going to talk about uh, that in a while. And on the other hand, there are uh, very efficient numerical tools like TDMRG, MPS, tensor network based methods that allow us to simulate uh, quantum dynamics, quantum anybody dynamics, and get a glimpse of what is happening in a controllable uh, situation. Now, why do we focus in particular in one spatial dimension? Well, uh, on the other hand, we have exact analytical tools like integrability and uh, exact dualities uh, that allow us to study, uh, uh, in principle, exactly the dynamics of uh, quantum models in one dimension. And on the other hand, the, the numerical tools that I mentioned before are primarily uh, uh, can be applied to one plus one dimensional systems due to the scaling of entanglement and so on. Okay, so let me now uh, uh, talk about uh, a specific uh, example of cold, cold atom experiments uh, that, uh, as I said, can, can help us uh, simulate continuous quantum field theory models. Uh, first of all, what do we what do we mean about uh, when we talk about quantum simulation? We know that uh, quantum systems are hard to, to solve because of the exponential uh, scaling of uh, the Hilbert space with the number of particles. Uh, so uh, there is a, a challenge in, in solving these models. And the idea of Feynman was to use a quantum computer in order to simulate uh, such systems. Uh, so, uh, by quantum simulation, we mean that uh, we use a quantum uh, system uh, whose Hamiltonian, uh, whose description can be uh, corresponds to uh, a model that we are interested in. And uh, we let the system, uh, we make experiments on this system and we see, we get as output the answer to the questions that we are interested in for the theoretical model. So this is what, what uh, has been achieved in uh, these experiments of the, uh, the atom chip group in Vienna, uh, uh, which are uh, conducted by uh, Professor Schmidt Meyer. Uh, and let me give some, some brief explanation of what they are doing. They are using uh, one dimensional quasi condensates of uh, bosonic uh, particles of atoms. Uh, which uh, they are, they can be controlled by the magnetic uh, trap uh, produced by a, an atom chip. So uh, it can be precisely controlled by the by an electronic uh, device, uh, and this gives them a high uh, uh, tunability in the parameters of the system and 
uh, that, that allows them to, to do uh, precise protocols of uh, out of equilibrium dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. In particular, uh, the application that I'm mostly interested in here is uh, the case where they have two parallel uh, quasi one dimensional condensates, which are close to each other, and uh, so that there is hoping between uh, the two uh, uh, subsystems. In this case, the hoping plays the role of a Jodderson junction, which gives rise uh, in an effective uh, description of the phase and density field of the condensate to the so-called sine Gordon model. So this is what, what's going to, uh, what I'm going to talk uh, about in most of the following of the talk. Uh, the sine Gordon model is described by this Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, where phi is the phase of the, the relative phase between the two uh, condensates. And uh, as you can see, it has a, a free part, uh, this quadratic part. Unfortunately, I can't see my mouse, but, uh, and, and it has an interacting part that corresponds, that, that, is, that has a form of this uh, cosine potential. And now in the experiments, they can tune the parameters of this model. And, and then they can uh, let the, the gas expand and through these they, they get interference patterns uh, from which they can extract information about the phase profile as a function of the parameter x of the coordinate. And then by repeating the experiment many, many times, uh, hundreds uh, or even thousands of times, uh, they, they, they can extract the uh, full distribution of the phase profiles and uh, uh, by doing uh, dynamical protocols like quenches that I'm going to talk about later, we can see the development of these probability distributions over time. So uh, the dynamics of these, uh, of these uh, fields uh, can be controlled to be either the sine Gordon, or either given by the sine Gordon model, or if we tune the parameters so that there is no cosine interaction, uh, they are given by simply the quadratic part, which in the context of uh, 1D physics, it's called Latinger liquid. Uh, and in the context of high energy, it's just the simplest, one of the simplest conformal field theories, that of a free uh, uh, Gaussian, uh, a free boson field. Okay, so uh, a few more words about the quantum sign Gordon model. Uh, note that uh, since phi is a phase field, it's, uh, it has a topology of a circle. So uh, it's allowed to take values between zero and two pi. And, uh, or in this case, uh, it's actually two pi over beta if we express it in this particular form, uh, which means that uh, the ground state of this model is, uh, uh, there, is an there is an infinite number of ground states which correspond to the minima of the potential. And therefore there are uh, also solitonic configurations that correspond to field configurations where the field uh, changes from zero to two pi as we go from minus infinity, uh, minus special infinity to plus infinity. Uh, now solitons, uh, as I said, uh, can be uh, represented in this form. Uh, in the classical case, uh, so the, the, the profile that uh, describes a soliton interpolates between the value zero and two pi, and we can have moving solitons, we can have static solitons, and uh, in the classical case, uh, we can see that uh, there are also, um, we can study the scattering between two solitons, and we can see that it's elastic which uh, means that uh, the full dynamics of uh, a set of solitons can be described by, uh, by means of uh, using the tools of integrability and the better ansatz, because there is never production of more particles than we, we have initially. So this is a very important uh, uh, advantage because it allows us to uh, solve exactly these models, uh, at least in principle, uh, in the sense that we can construct um, I mean, we can construct in the quantum case, the Fox space describing all the excitations of the system. I should say that uh, the solitons of the classical model persist at the quantum level, so they are stable excitations and uh, they are also elastically scattering in the quantum case, which is the, the advantage that we have 
in, in this model. Now, uh, solitons can also form bound, state, bound states, which are called breathers. Uh, this is a, a video of a breather in the classical case. Uh, in the quantum case, these, these pictures are, well, should be understood as rather as uh, asymptotic solutions. So uh, when we consider a breather in the quantum case, it, it, gives, uh, it corresponds to an excitation, an excited state of the system where the two solitons are delocalized in all space. But in the classical case, we can imagine them like uh, two solitons that are uh, bound to each other through the interaction. Um, actually, yeah, sorry, in the previous animation was uh, about the scattering of two solitons. This is a breather. You can see that the two solitons uh, remain close to each other and don't move away. Uh, okay, so uh, so now what do we do uh, in, in the theoretical description of this model? And how do we see these solitons in the experiment? Uh, the, the output of the experiment is uh, an ensemble of uh, phase profiles like uh, those shown here. And in, in the case where the potential is a parabolic potential, uh, or any potential that has a single minimum, the distribution would look like this. In the Gaussian case of a parabolic potential, it would look like uh, it would have a Gaussian distribution when we uh, average, when we take the distribution of all phases at all points. So we have a field that is simply, uh, that has simply harmonic fluctuations. But in the case that solitons are present, uh, the field uh, can jump from one of the two minima to another one and possibly also to uh, two times uh, two pi, so integer multiples of two pi. And therefore, uh, the uh, distribution of the phases uh, exhibits a, a markedly different distribution. It has uh, a, a bell-shaped in the uh, bell-shaped distribution in the middle, but it has also these satellite peaks at integer multiples of two pi. And indeed, in the experiment through uh, atom interferometry and analysis of these uh, phase profiles, it was possible to show uh, that uh, under uh, in, that in certain cases, in this fast cooling uh, protocol the distribution of the phases exhibits uh, the satellite peaks at uh, plus minus two pi. Of course, the, the higher peaks and larger multiples of two pi are suppressed because it's ener energetically uh, unfavorable, to, unfavorable to excite many, uh, many uh, more solitons. I, I have one doubt if I can stop you just to understand what yes. this fast and slow cooling mean. I I'm not familiar with this. Uh, so this in the works, experiment, uh, they, they can uh, they can do either a, a fast. Uh, they can cool the gas either uh, quickly or slowly. In the in the case that they cool it slowly, uh, the procedure is almost adiabatic, and the system is always at uh, thermal equilibrium. And at thermal equilibrium, the the excitations that correspond to solitons are uh, strongly suppressed. So that's why we don't see many of these uh, satellite peaks uh, or a strong weight uh, on these peaks. But in the case that they do fast cooling, uh, some of these uh, uh, soliton configurations uh, freeze in the, in, in, in the, in the initial state uh, because they start from uh, a configuration where the field has uh, larger fluctuations. So they go quickly to uh, the sign Gordon uh, Hamiltonian with where, where they are uh, pinned at the minima of the potential and they get frozen. It's a sort of Kibble Zurich uh, mechanism, essentially. Uh, and for that reason, we have a high probability to, to have uh, this type of uh, jumps by plus minus two pi. Uh, and the bottom part of this plot, you can see one instance of uh, such uh, a soliton in one of the interference uh, patterns that shows the, the phase profile. So you can see that there are these sort of jumps in the phase uh, if one tries to, to draw a line, to fit a line at the maximum of this uh, uh, phase coherence factor, as it is called. 
and it's exactly uh, uh, 2 pi in this case. Uh, now, uh, having computed the, the phase correlation, the phase uh, profiles, one can also calculate the, the correlations between phase at different points. How strongly uh, dependent are is the value of the phase at one point uh, with respect to another point? And in this case, the, the experimentalists can uh, solve, in a sense, uh, the unknown um, properties of the sine Gordon model at equilibrium by measuring the full correlation function, uh, the full set of correlation functions of the phase of any order. So two point, three, uh, four point, et cetera. Uh, here, for example, you can see the deviations from Gaussianity when we are in the limit of either a very strong uh, value of the, of the mass parameter in the sine Gordon, the potential becomes very steep and it can be approximated by a, a parabolic potential. So fluctuations are really small, close to the, the minimum of the potential. And in this case, we can approximate the theory by a Klein-Gordon theory, which is uh, quadratic. And therefore, Wick's theorem applies, which means that if I calculate a four-point correlation function, it will be simply uh, factorized into as a sum of, of products of two-point functions. So the experimentalists uh, could uh, compute the connected part of the correlation functions and show that it's, uh, it's small in this case. And it's also small in the case where there is no interaction at all when uh, the cosine potential uh, vanishes, when they tune the parameters to, to, to make it zero. While for inter intermediate values of the interaction, uh, far from the uh, strongly, uh, so far from the strong parameter uh, regime and the weak parameter regime, we get uh, overall values or a, a huge change in the non Gaussianity of the system. Uh, another thing that they can do in the experiment is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they can do, they can study dynamics. And in fact, uh, this was the first experiment or the only experiment that has uh, demonstrated the emergence of a non-thermal ensemble uh, of a generalized Gibbs ensemble uh, when one changes the parameter from the strongly interacting regime to the weakly interacting regime. In this case, uh, the potential changes from a, a steep parabolic potential to uh, the case where there is no uh, potential at all, the, the Latin gel liquid model. And by probing the, by following the dynamics of correlations, they were able, able to show that uh, uh, the correlations cannot be described by a thermal ensemble. One needs more than one effective temperature to describe it, uh, which is precisely the definition of a generalized Gibbs, Gibbs ensemble. Well, or not so precisely, one should check how many exactly are the conserved quantities that are involved, etc. But uh, uh, so what I want to say, stress is that uh, the, there is uh, there are many possibilities in this type of experiments, and the theory is still. Uh, I mean, it's it's it, we are missing some theoretical tools to to describe it in full. For that reason, we started thinking uh, about a numerical approach to. Sorry, Spiros. Yes. May I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Sure, um, I was wondering whether there is the possibility of uh, describing somehow this experiment. Uh, on the dynamics of correlation function with the use of uh, generalized hydro, more specifically the quantum version to get the behavior of. Uh, I of think the there, time. Is, there is definitely interest in this direction, and also the group has developed efficient uh, numerical codes for the simulation by means of generalized hydrodynamics. Uh, the problem, as you can guess, is that. In the description that we are using here, uh, which is the, the effective description of the phase and density field, uh, the, the, the effective model is the sine Gordon model. And for such models, there is no... Uh, yeah, we should go to the Lattinger limit. Yes. Yeah, uh, okay. But of course, of course, uh, one could do something else. The, the, the actual uh, quantum gas is described by, by the Lieblinger model. So one can mm -hmm. use the generalized hydrodynamic theory for the Latin, for, sorry, for the Lieb-Linear model. So to, to, to explain myself, the sine Gordon model is integrable. Uh, so the generalized hydrodynamics applies, but we don't know what, how exactly to construct the charges of this model for a general uh, value, for general values of the parameter. 
uh, while uh, in the original description in terms of uh, bosons uh, uh, describing the, the uh, cold atom, uh, the system is a Leibniz gear gas and uh, having two such systems parallel to each other corresponds to, well, two Leibniz gear gases that are in contact with each other. So, of course, this is uh, non-integrable uh, if we have the two uh, system cases. Uh, because the coupling between them would, would break integrability, but uh, generalized hydrodynamics can be used uh, or extended in a, in a much no, no more way. Uh, okay, thank so you. I think there is strong interest in this direction and um, some of the experimentalists are working on this. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so let me now uh, talk about uh, the methods that we used. Uh, and let let me explain a bit better why we look at at this uh, 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 why we started to think about these methods. So as I said, the sine Gordon model is integrable due to the fact that the solitons uh, scatter elastically, uh, which uh, which is a great advantage because combined with uh, relativistic in invariance. Uh, it uh, gives rise to this, uh, to the application of this S matrix bootstrap, which means that we can calculate uh, properties like the mass spectrum uh, and the S matrix. Uh, and with this, uh, with these tools, we can calculate the so-called form factors of local operators, uh, which are essentially matrix elements of uh, local fields in the basis of uh, the solitonic excitation. So we can construct the Fox space as in a free theory by, op by acting with uh, creation and annihilation operators of the solitons. And, and this allows us to, to, to practically, or uh, not practically, but in principle to solve the, the model. But the pro progress in this direction is really slow. So uh, it started in 1975 or 79, when the, it was uh, shown that the, it was conjectured it's uh, exactly uh, solvable in the quantum case as well. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, with very slow steps, people were able to calculate uh, ground state expectation values of uh, local fields or two point correlations in the ground state. Then eventually uh, thermal correlations is an ongoing project that, that, is, uh, that, that, uh, that is obstructed by uh, fundamental conceptual problems uh, of the theory. So, uh, there are recent proposals, but the, the, the field is still open and it's not clear how to calculate uh, correlation functions of this model, uh, neither at thermal equilibrium nor uh, in, the, in the case of, um, of quenches out of equilibrium. So if the goal of uh, solving uh, a quantum field theory is to calculate the values of observables and correlation functions, we are still far from, from this by means of analytical tools. So what we thought was to, to cheat a little bit and go faster to the, to the top of the mountain by using a numerical technique that doesn't uh, require uh, facing all of these uh, conceptual problems of the analytical theory. The method that we use is called truncated conformal space approach. And it's a numerical method for the study of continuous uh, one plus one mainly dimensional models irrespective of whether they are integrable or non-integrable. It's based on renormalization group theory and conformal field theory. And in contrast to uh, tensor network uh, methods, it's, it, 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 it's, it applies to uh, continuous models uh, where the dimensionality of the Hilbert space is uh, from the beginning infinite. Uh, now, the positive thing is that it can capture rather efficiently non-perturbative effects. We have seen that um, in the calculation of the ground state and low energy properties. But the negative aspect is that uh, it doesn't really solve the curse of dimensionality problem. The fact that the Hilbert phase of a quantum system grows uh, fast, exponentially fast with the number of degrees of freedom. So we are still limited to uh, essentially matrices to, to dimensions that uh, correspond to a matrix problem uh, of dimensions of 10,000 or at least 100,000, which are the, the limitations of exact diagonalization. Uh, let me explain a little bit more how exactly this method works. 
So the problem is to find the spectrum of a continuous quantum field theory, which we, we uh, put in a finite volume so that the spectrum is uh, discrete. Um, now, one of the simplest ideas one would have would be to express the Hamiltonian of this model uh, as a perturbation, if you want, of, uh, of another Hamiltonian that we, we know its spectrum exactly. It's an exactly solvable uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, and then the perturbation, we also need to know how uh, it is represented in the basis of uh, H0, of the H0 Hamiltonian. So we have known spectrum and eigenvalues and eigenstates for H0 and known matrix elements of uh, delta H, the perturbation, in the basis of H0. Uh, and then if we uh, put the system in finite volume so that the spectrum is discrete and we apply uh, some high energy cutoff to, to make the to restrict the infinite Hilbert space into a finite uh, truncated Hilbert space. Uh, then we have essentially a matrix problem. We have a matrix that describes the Hamiltonian and we can diagonalize it by numerical means. Of course, uh, uh, in the sign Gordon case, the, the, the H not part, exactly solvable part is chosen to be this, uh, the, the free part of the sign Gordon model. So the conformal, the free boson conformal field theory. And the interaction is uh, the cos beta phi. Uh, and indeed, it can be expanded easily in the conformal basis using the algebraic tools of conformal field theory. Uh, now, if we do this procedure, we'll find out that uh, uh, the Hamiltonian matrix uh, has, um, in fact, it has a self similar uh, form. And if we keep increasing the cutoff, the energy cutoff that we use, and keep expanding the truncated Hilbert space, uh, we would hope to, to uh, reach convergence. So, of course, the, the, the exact problem is to solve, uh, to find the spectrum in infinite Hilbert space, but this is impossible numerically. So the only thing that we can hope for is to increase the cutoff and see convergence of the numerically obtained uh, spectrum to some uh, spectrum that we would uh, expect to be the exact spectrum. Uh, in the cases for, of the numerical implementations that we've done, um, the you know, when we change the truncation cutoff, that is the energy of the conformal field theory uh, used for truncation, uh, we see that uh, the number of states increases mm, almost exponentially, a bit slower than exponentially. And this is the maximum uh, truncation cutoff that we have reached. Now, uh, a, a, an important warning is that uh, if we apply this procedure in general, we wouldn't, uh, nothing guarantees that by increasing the cutoff, we would reach uh, convergence. Um, so if I did that for a general model, I could choose the free, the free part of the Hamiltonian in different ways. And nothing would tell me that uh, uh, by splitting, doing different splittings, I would get convergence of the numerical spectrum. But there is one uh, intuition, very crucial intuition that comes from RG theory, which is that if the perturbation delta H is a relevant operator of the conformal field theory describing the, the uh, that corresponds to H naught, then we know that uh, the low energy part of this uh, uh, Hamiltonian H uh, will be uh, considerably different from that of the conformal field theory of the free part. But at higher energies, it will come closer and closer to that of the free part. So asymptotically, at high energies, the system, the model is still uh, free. It's still described by the spectrum of H0. And uh, it is only at low energies that we have strong uh, deviations from the spectrum of H0. And due to this reason or this expectation from RG theory, if we keep increasing the cutoff, we will see smaller and smaller corrections uh, coming from the high energy part of the, of the perturbation, delta H. And for that reason, we, we can hope that we will reach convergence. If we chose delta H to be a, a, an irrelevant operator instead, then it would be the high energy part that uh, gets modified while the low energy part doesn't. In that case, uh, the method would just never converge. It would keep changing. The spectrum would keep changing uh, with the cutoff. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions about the methods, please let me know now. Otherwise, I will go to the next part.
Fritz is the, the presentation of some of the main results that we had. So just maybe a precision concerning your previous slide. Uh, yeah, what? Uh, no, the one with the matrix. Yeah. Yes. So each, let's say, square, increasingly bigger square is when you, you increase the, the, tr the truncation, right? Yes, exactly. But so here it feels, I mean, each square is by increasing one to the, to the, to the, to the amount of truncation that you do, or is it by changing five as uh, was written on the table? Like, uh, this is uh, each one corresponds to increasing uh, by one. So okay, I say okay. that uh, the conformal field theory spectrum is somewhat exceptional or very mm -hmm. exceptional in that it has uh, extensive degeneracies. Mm -hmm. The conformal field theories uh, correspond to, well, it, it, it's probably not uh, the right moment to explain all that, but uh, it's... Uh, when I we can wait huh, if it puts you in a... In a... <laughs> An embarrassing uh, order for your presentation. No, no well, I will just say that uh, uh, when we increase the truncation cutoff by one, there are um, exponentially many, uh, there is an increasing number of uh, degenerate states that are included in the energy cell. And that's why the size of these boxes increases with, uh, mm -hmm. with the cutoff. And what's, that's why exactly uh, the Hamiltonian has this uh, block diagonal, well, not block, block diagonal form, but it has this pattern with the, the block structure. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the matrix elements of uh, the sine Golden Hamiltonian in the CFT basis uh, have uh, strong dependence on the, uh, on, on the cell, the energy cells to which they correspond. And, and some internal structure in each of these uh, blocks. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so now uh, let me uh, present uh, three or four if there is time. Unfortunately, I can't see my, <laughs> I can't see the time. I don't know how much time I have. So I would say it's already 2.11. Uh, if you wind up in 10 minutes, we'll have some time for questions. Ah, great. Okay, I will be slow. Um, okay, so uh, we, we have uh, explored some effects of uh, the presence of uh, topological excitations, solitons, uh, both in and out of equilibrium. And I will start with uh, the effects on, on uh, ground state correlations and thermal correlations. So here, uh, by using the method that uh, I described before, we construct a spectrum of the sine Gordon model in a finite box. And then uh, we compute correlations of the phase field at different points. And in the massless case, we get a plot like the one on the left side. Uh, in the massive case, uh, we have uh, exponential decay of the correlations away from the diagonal. While in the sine Gordon case, we have this uh, perhaps surprisingly uh, longer range uh, correlations. And this is due to the fact that the phase field is actually um, not strictly speaking a local field uh, because you know phases in quantum physics are not cannot be measured uh, but they, but only the difference between phase can be measured. So practically what is measured here is the difference of the phase from the edge of the system where it is fixed to zero. And for that reason, it's like a string-like object that is the integral uh, of the derivative of the phase from one point to the other. So we have this, this uh, uh, long-range looking um, correlations. Uh, we also computed uh, correlations in thermal states, which is more interesting for the experiment uh, because the states of the experimental system are essentially thermal. And we were also able to compute the non-Gaussianity of these uh, correlations. So measuring four point functions and uh, measuring the difference of the uh, four point correlation from the weak, weak theorem prediction. We are able to measure a version of the kurtosis, uh, a multi-point uh, version of the kurtosis of the, uh, of the system. And we were able to explain the, the experimentally observed uh, behavior that at low temperatures the system 
um, uh, behaves like uh, free because we see essentially the bottom part of the interaction of the potential, which is parabolic. Uh, at high temperature, the uh, non-Gaussianity drops again because we are uh, the energy of the of the thermal state is far above the potential, the maximum of the potential. So we are in the asymptotically free regime. But at intermediate values, we have a strong deviations from Gaussianity because we see uh, precisely the non-trivial part of the potential. Uh, and this matches with, the, as I said, with the prediction, with the measurements of the experiment uh, system. Uh, now, the next thing that uh, we studied numerically was uh, quench dynamics. So we could um, produce nice or, well, cool plots of the uh, correlation of functions uh, as functions of time and see, uh, observe the difference from the free case and also explore the, uh, uh, the spectral, do a spectral analysis of this. Um, we could also make some uh, nice videos, which is just for visualization purposes, of course. But from the uh, theoretical point of view, what, uh, what we found most exciting is what I'm going to present next, which is uh, the, what we call the violation of the horizon effect after a quantum quench. Um, so when we do a quantum quench in a relativistic quantum field theory, uh, we usually see that the correlation spread in, in a light cone form. That because uh, the, in the initial state, uh, when in the initial state the correlations uh, decay exponentially, uh, distant points are uh, uncorrelated practically, and one would have to wait for uh, a sufficient time until the signal uh, of uh, excitations from the middle of the uh, of the distance between the two points reaches the two observers. And it is only then that we see uh, a change in the correlations uh, um, uh, between the two points. This was uh, pointed out by Calabrese and Cardi uh, when they started talking about quenches. And uh, a combined effect of the relativistic invariance and the fact that the initial correlations uh, satisfy clustering. Um, okay, and since then it has been observed in lattice systems because also those uh, satisfy the Libre Robinson bound, which can be seen under the, the analog of relativistic invariance in uh, lattice models. And has also been observed experimentally in various different uh, systems. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, those examples more. I want to go directly to what happens in the case of sine Gordon dynamics. So in, in, in our simulation, we, uh, we started with uh, uh, an initial state that is the ground state of the klein Gordon model that is given by this Hamiltonian, which is quadratic. And we know exactly that the correlation length uh, in this uh, ground state is of the order of the inverse of the initial mass of the mass M0. So it has precisely exponential uh, clustering, exponential decay of correlations. And then we, uh, we switch from, from this Hamiltonian to the sine Gordon Hamiltonian, and we do the dynamics uh, with uh, the sine Gordon Hamiltonian. And we observe, we measure the correlations between different points at the same time t. And um, what we observed was the following, that if we do the Klein-Gordon uh, dynamics for, for this type of uh, quench, we see a perfectly nice uh, horizon up to some numerical artifacts that increase uh, when the parameters go far from the CFT point. Uh, but uh, when we do the same with the sine gordon dynamics and measure the phi-phi correlations, the phase correlations, we don't see, uh, we don't see this uh, light cone uh, pattern. Uh, and on the other hand, for the phi-phi correlations, one may expect that because, as I said, phase is a field that uh, no matter how you calculate it, it's practically a difference between uh, phases at different points uh, because we need some reference point to, to start measuring the, the phase. So it's inevitably a non-local field in this sense that we integrate from, uh, from, from another point uh, the, the actual local field, which is the d phi. The d phi corresponds to the density of uh, solitons in the system. 
And this is the one that, that can be considered as a local field. Uh, now, when we computed the DeFi, DeFi correlations, because as I said, this is the local field, we still found that there was a strong deviation from, from what we expected to see. There is some uh, light cone bump, if you want, but we see that correlations spread also outside of that, of that bump and they have a characteristic oscillatory uh, uh, behavior, which increases and the, the frequency of these oscillations increases when we increase the interaction beta of, of the sine Gordon model. So now that was quite uh, peculiar for us because- S Sorry, Spiro, just yeah. uh, one question on the, on the slide before. Ah, yes. D does it mean, uh, if I understood well, that if you were to be able to diagonalize fully the Hamiltonian, which is difficult because the system is not integrable, but assuming you do, and then you look at the excitation in this um, eigenbasis, then you would observe a nice light cone, or is it really impossible for this uh, Hamiltonian? Uh, the Hamiltonian is relativistically invariant, but when we truncate it, as you say, as you probably guessed, uh, we break the Lorentz invariant. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. only approximately that, th that this holds. And so at first we thought that we were almost sure that this is a numerical effect. Mm -hmm. But then we increased the truncation cutoff and we, uh, we found out that uh, the effect doesn't go, it doesn't diminish, and uh, it actually converges. The oscillations converge when we increase the cutoff. So we did all, we, we know that the, the method is still very strongly limited by the, uh, the small Hilbert space di um, dimension that we can uh, simulate. And we took very seriously the, the possibility that there are numerical artifacts, but uh, uh, by increasing the cutoff, we saw convergence of this uh, out of light cone uh, pattern. And, uh, we could only think that this is uh, this is something real. There is one more question. Uh, I can't hear. Yes, Aritra, if you're talking, uh, we cannot hear you because you are muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, uh, so, so this uh, this is at which which temperature? So this is at increasing temperature. No, so uh, th these plots from left to right correspond to increasing uh, the beta parameter, which is the interaction here. Uh, yeah, I should go back and show what is the Hamiltonian. Well, here, for example, sorry. So the beta parameter controls the, the interaction, the, um, the, 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 dif the distance between the minima of the potential. Uh, so for for small beta, uh, we we get to the limit where we can uh, approximate the potential by a parabolic trap because it becomes very steep. But uh, increasing beta, we we go away from that approximation. Okay, and uh, and yeah, sorry. Yeah, and and that is is that the reason? Like in for the for the first two curves, I don't see much the light cone effect. Uh, the, the the periodic pattern is not outside the light cone effect. And then when I increased this delta or beta, the the pattern goes out of the effect. Is that the reason because of uh, the trapping? Yes, exactly. So for small beta, uh, we can approximate the Hamiltonian with which we do the dynamics with the Klein-Gordon Hamiltonian uh, okay. with a very large uh, mass. And, and therefore, in that limit, or even smaller values of delta, uh, we get what we get from the Klein-Gordon uh, simulation. But as we go far from that point, uh, we see the, the strongly interacting dynamics of the sine Gordon. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I won't have uh, too much time to go into the details, but um, uh, in trying to explain this uh, numerical observation, we realized that, um, as I said before, uh, the horizon effect, uh, when, when it's, it's present, it's a combination of uh, 
not only the relativistic invariance of the dynamics, but also uh, a property uh, of the initial state, which is that it has exponentially exponential clustering of correlations. This is a typical property that we always expect for from a local uh, from the from an equilibrium uh, state of a local Hamiltonian. But now uh, the tricky thing is that. Um, uh, when we do the dynamics under the sign Gordon model, the, the excitations which uh, describe these, uh, these dynamics are solid on fields. And as we know from the time when Coleman and Mandelstam uh, looked at the duality between the sign Gordon and the massive steering model, these solitons are non local fields uh, in the sense that they are given by this uh, expression. If I define the Solton field psi, creating a Solton at some position x, it involves uh, a strongly uh, non local operator, uh, the integral of uh, this pi field from one point up to the point x. So they are string like operators, if you want. So so uh, if we require that uh, these non local fields satisfy clustering. It's a property that we can't expect it to, to be true for, for any uh, state, like the ground state of the Klein-Gordon that we, we have here. Uh, for the Klein-Gordon ground state, we know that it satisfies clustering with respect to the local field of the Klein-Gordon theory. That is uh, simple uh, linear combinations of the bosonic field. But we have no idea whether uh, these properties should be satisfied for this strongly non-local field psi. And in fact, we can expect that it doesn't or we may. So to test if this is the explanation, if we have violation of clustering for the soliton fields in the initial state, uh, we, we exploited the duality of the sine Gordon model with the massive theory model, which allows us to uh, solve exactly the um, dynamics of uh, uh, sine Gordon points at the free fermion point. Of course, this from the point of view of the dynamics, this is the most uh, uh, boring point. But on the other hand, it has all the topological ingredients ingredients that, that are necessary to, to see what we wanted. So uh, using bosonization, and I can, I can give more details if there is interest later, uh, we were able to do uh, an analytical calculation of the two-point correlation function at the free fermion point. And we indeed saw uh, that the, there is a violation of the horizon. Uh, we uh, verified that this has nothing to do with uh, the dynamics and it has everything to do with uh, a violation of clustering in the initial state. So the, the fermionic operators, which describe the solitons of the free fermion point, uh, do not satisfy clustering in the initial state, which is the Klein-Gordon Klein ground state. Uh, later, or very recently, uh, actually, just to remind you, you have just four minutes. So like, if you can wind up in five minutes, we can have question answers for two to three minutes again. Yes, so great. Not I really think I should be in time. Too much. Uh, okay, so I should, uh, as, as uh, one uh, further, uh, one paper with further results, um, very recently, even one of uh, my collaborators in the previous work uh, studied the Swinger model, which is, uh, essentially the QED model in one plus one dimension. Uh, uh, it describes fermions interacting with the electromagnetic field, which by means of bosonization can be mapped to uh, a bosonic theory. And he used the same uh, similar tools like the, the numerical simulation uh, that we used in the other paper. And he found that the same effect is present also in one plus one dimensional QED um, that we can discuss later. Now, uh, another uh, application that we did recently was to study uh, the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, of the experimental system. Uh, when we start with a strongly interacting initial state, but we do the dynamics with the Latinger liquid, the, the conformal field theory uh, corresponding to zero potential, zero interaction. And there we had some uh, results based on um, th this protocol is one of the uh, of the problems that can be studied analytically, and there were some uh, expectations of uh, what the steady state should be. Uh, I won't go into the details; since there is not much time. Uh, but I can only say that um, uh, there was a strong surprise in that uh, we were expecting a different type of steady state, and the uh, experiment showed that. Uh, 
the steady state is different from, from the theory at first. And then we had to, to explore what is uh, what are the, the, the special properties of the, the initial state in this specific experimental protocol. And we realized that there is a new mechanism that can give uh, equilibration to a Gaussian state. This is something that we didn't expect to see here. Um, so the experiment really uh, uh, could drive us to, to the direction to, to find a new uh, theoretical mechanism. I can talk about that later if there is uh, interest in probably private uh, discussions. And the last point that I want to talk about is uh, a recent work that we did with uh, uh, Prosen and one student uh, in Ljubljana, uh, Michal Sedvisek, and uh, which is about uh, uh, signatures of quantum chaos in non-integrable quantum field theories. Um, so, as you may know, uh, when we go from uh, an integrable model to a non-integrable model, there is a very striking uh, change in the spectra of these models, in that it starts with uh, level crossings. There are level crossings in the integrable case, but uh, le energy levels repulse when we go to the non-integrable uh, case. And uh, this has been checked uh, many times uh, under very different settings in lattice models, but it hasn't been possible so far, apart from uh, one work, I think, very pioneering work by uh, Musardo and collaborators uh, some years ago. Uh, so it has been studied very, very sparsely in the context of continuous models. And this is what we were trying to, to do here. Um, so, exactly because of this change from level crossing to level repulsion, in the integrable case, the statistics of uh, level spacing is described by a Poisson distribution, which is markedly different than the uh, random matrix theory uh, uh, predictions that uh, hold in the case of non integrable models. Uh, so, this is wh what exactly we did. In, we studied in the double sign Gordon model. As I said, the sign Gordon model is integrable, but the double sign Gordon model is non integrable. And yeah. uh, it's can I just say something? It's already two thirty one. Yes. So I mean, it would be nice that we just try to conclude now in yes. net, next maximum two minutes. Yes. Sorry. Yes, that... So what we observed was that uh, the level spacing statistic is indeed described by the expected Poisson and uh, GOE statistics when we go from the sign Gordon to the uh, double sign Gordon model, and we were able to get uh, the phase diagram co corresponding to different parameter values. Um, so the, the, the lines, sorry, the straight lines here correspond to exactly the sign Gordon points. But then when we computed the eigenvector component statistics, which is another test of uh, quantum chaos in non-integrable models, we found that these are uh, markedly different from what we expected to see. We were expecting to see Gaussian distributions, but instead they had a, a, a long tails that looked more like power law, uh, so more like power law behavior. Okay, so with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, um, the general message is that I think there, are, there is much to explore and many surprises in continuous quantum field theories. And um, it, I think that this, this method that, we are, that I present here has the potential to give us a glimpse of, of, of this exotic phenomenon. And uh, at the same time is useful for uh, applications to uh, groundbreaking experiments in the field of uh, cold, atom, uh, cold atoms in continuous models. So uh, with that, I conclude and I would like to thank you for your attention.